Canada Park is steeped in controversy and haunted by hatred. It's a lush oasis that was paid for by Canadians, Jews and Christians, but hides an Arab past. Tonight, we'll tell the story behind that park. It has divided some Israelis and angered many Palestinians. It is a park with no peace. Welcome to Canada Park, a short drive from Jerusalem. It appears to be a serene haven in a troubled region. Canadians paid for this park, a popular weekend spot open to both Israelis and Palestinians. But the young men who race their bikes here pass within a few feet of Palestinian graves. Picnic tables sit amid the rubble and reinforced concrete of demolished houses. This is all that remains of Imwas, a Palestinian village now erased from the map. Some people believe this Imwas to be the biblical Imwas, the place where Jesus first met his disciples after the resurrection an inspiration for the old masters. On the other side of Canada Park, more rubble, more reinforced concrete. The remains of another village, Yalu. Just beyond the hills of the park was Beit Nuba. It too is now gone, and in its place sit the trailers of a new community, an Israeli settlement. The three villages were leveled by the Israeli army. About 10,000 people were driven out. In 1967, Israel feared an assault from neighboring Egypt and launched a preemptive strike. Israel was to win the war within six days. On the first day, Jordan entered the war, and Israel quickly captured land up to the Jordan River, known as the West Bank. Part of that land commanded the road to Jerusalem. It was a thumbprint known as the Latrun Salient, where once stood the villages of Imwas, Yalu, and Beit Nuba. Today, it is the site of Canada Park, a park filled with antiquities and recreation areas, according to the official tourist guide. The names of the Canadians who gave $15 million to build the park are displayed at its entrance. Their money was donated to the Jewish National Fund, an agency affiliated with the Israeli government that reforests and procures land for Israel. The JNF's plantings provide a shady respite amid the ruins, but can't conceal what the Israeli army left behind. The destruction of what used to be here was protested by then Israeli parliament uh, member Yuri Avneri. By putting that park there and calling it Canada Park, uh, you give a Canadian cover-up to a war crime. Lush groves now cover the hills along what was the main street in the disappeared village of Imwas. It used to look like this. That's my house. We showed these slides to an Imwas village elder now living in Jordan. It was the first time Ibrahim El Sheikh had seen photographs of the demolition. Such destruction. These photographs were taken by an Israeli soldier. Another soldier ordered to take part in the destruction protested by writing a detailed account. He is reluctant to discuss it today, but Amos Keenan stands by his report. I told the truth, and the truth is what I saw. Can you describe it for me now, though? I'd like to hear you No, say. It, it is described perfectly in the report, and it's on the spot, in true time, and it's better than I could describe it now. Here is part of what Amos Keenan wrote. The unit commander told us that it had been decided to blow up three villages in our sector. They were Beit Nuba, Imwas, and Yalu. They were old people who could hardly walk, murmuring old women, mothers carrying babies, small children. The children wept and asked for water. They all carried white flags. On that road, 24 years ago, was Hussein Salima. He remembers his flight from Yalu. My brother and I had got separated from our mother, and we were searching for her. Then someone told us where she was, and because I was young, I started running, and I got very thirsty. So thirsty that I, I thought I was going to die. 
And I started crying. I need water. Soldier Amos Keenan continues his report. More old people, more women, more babies. They dropped down exhausted where we told them to sit. Some had a cow or two, a calf, all their property on earth. We drove them out. They go on wandering in the south like lost cattle. The weak die. Imwas elder Ibrahim El Sheikh remembers some of those who died. Yes, people died on the road. One old man from Beit Nuba was lying under a cedar tree resting, and he died. He was about 78 years old. Muhammad Shahada Mustafa died. He was disabled. And Zab Ahmad Musa also died on the road. <coughs> this is what's left of Mr. Al Sheikh's house. A door, some rusted steel rods, and rubble. It's the sort of rubble that litters this park, but is not mentioned in the JNF guide. It directs visitors to ancient ruins and ignores that only 24 years ago, these were the homes of Arab families. Prior to our visit to Canada Park, the Jewish National Fund's Toronto office assured us the park was built on only the fields of these villages, not on their remains. But this clearly is the site of Yalu Village. There is evidence everywhere. The sabra plants grown for hedges, the fruits of the gardens, and the skeletons of the homes. Yet despite all of this, the JNF in Israel denies this village is in their park. Benny Mushkin is their director of information. No, Yalu is not in the park, I think. Yes, it is. Yalu is not inside the park. I'm sorry. What is in the park are JNF signs like this one, which point the way toward Yalu. Once you've found Yalu, there are signs to guide you through it, on larger signs marked with both the JNF logo and, in Hebrew, Canada Park. I repeat and say it again, Yalu is not well, in the area of the park. Well, you've got a sign there saying That's, it is, Mr. Mushkin. Then it's a mistake. Have you walked around the park and seen the reinforced concrete that represents the homes of these people? I've been to this park a number of times, yes. Have you noticed the rubble from these people's homes? Not that I can remember, but I wouldn't be surprised if I saw some. Will you say, yes or no, that this park sits on two Arab villages? No, all I can tell you is that within the area of the park, there are two Arab villages. For the Canadians who thought they were reforesting Israel, the ruins might come as a surprise. We asked Benny Mushkin if the JNF told them Imwas and Yalu are in the park. Did you tell them? that it's built on two... No, we did not. You didn't? No, we did not. No, because we... No, no, excuse me, because we did not build a park on the two villages. All we did is take the area which was here and, as I say, reconstruct it, enhanced it, and improved it against what we received here when we entered the area. The area is much, much nicer now than it was before. Well, the people who lived here before they were thrown out might not say that. That's their, that's their prerogative, definitely. After the 1967 war, Palestinian refugees scrambled across the Allenby Bridge into Jordan. Among them were thousands of homeless villagers from Imwas, Yalu, and Beit Nuba. Their new community was a series of tents pitched in a barren desert. Although many would leave this camp and be assimilated into Jordanian society, there are those who remain. The Talbia refugee camp, once thought temporary, has stood now for 24 years. We toured the camp with Dr. Ismail Zaid, a former resident of Beit Nuba. He was visiting Jordan from Halifax, where he is a professor of pathology at Dalhousie University. He introduced us to his former neighbor, Amina Suleiman. Beit Nuba was taken just one day after her wedding. The bride and groom had left the village for the night and were never allowed to return. All our clothes, everything was at home. Is there anything more precious than your land? It's my homeland, my country. Take my eyes, let me stagger blind in the street, but don't take my homeland. God willing, she says we are willing to go and eat, eat soil in our village. How painful is it for you to hear this sort of a story? 
I think it's immeasurable pain. What do you mean, Dr. Sun? To see how my own people are dispossessed completely and driven out in their homes and have to live in shacks here, deprived of their birthright, while hundreds of thousands of foreigners, complete aliens from Kiev and Moscow and Toronto, can go and live on my land and their land. It's immeasurably painful, I can't tell you how much. But I, I understand the pain of these people. I grew up with them and I lived with them and I know that they're attached to the land. Dr. Zaid was furious when he discovered that people in his new country, Canada, were collecting money to put a park over villages that neighbored his own, and that those donations were tax deductible. I was mortified when I read in the Chronicle Herald in 1978 that uh, people in Halifax were being honored, and I repeat the word honored, for building Canada Park on the ruins of people's homes in Amois and vicinity. And I thought, this is appalling. And, yet, and, and there was the Premier of Nova Scotia, the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, the Mayor of Halifax, participating in this honoring process. I don't Dr. Zaid carries with him a set of useless keys to a door he will never unlock. My mother, when they walked out of our house, well, quite innocently, she thought that they just came to be told to stay out of the village for a few hours or a few days and, and we'll be returning back. So she brought the keys to our house with her. But of course, the house doesn't exist anymore, but we still hold the keys for what it's worth. These are the remains of Dr. Zaid's house. On land that once belonged to his family, new houses for different families. Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank. Abu Majid laments the loss of his land, too. He was born in the village of Imwas. He views the commemorative plaques at the entrance to Canada Park with bitterness. They stand now where his house once stood. When you have lost everything, you of course feel sad. But when you see other people helping your oppressor, that just intensifies the tragedy. He must make his way past afternoon picnickers to pay his respects to dead relatives. His parents lie here in this neglected cemetery where he comes to pray at their headstone and remember the day they lost this village. There was no battle in our village. Not a single shot was fired at the Israeli army. I can confirm that. We were sitting with the Mukhtar at around midnight when a Jordanian officer named Fawzi came and told us that they were pulling out and we would have to manage for ourselves. The Israelis entered the village as if they were on parade. This is the Israeli army entering the villages. There is no evidence in these photographs taken by one of the soldiers they met any resistance. The pictures corroborate the testimony of other troops who say a search turned up only one wounded Egyptian commando. The destruction of villages occupied by civilians was a sinister action in the eyes of then Knesset member Yuri Abneri. Civilian population is protected under international law, under the uh, Hague Convention, the Geneva Conventions, and uh, was certainly uh, a, a war crime, no question about it. The eradication of these villages and the, the deportation or the uh, expulsion of the villagers, especially in the very inhuman, inhumane way in which it was done according to what Amos Kanan uh, testified to, uh, th these are crimes under any standard of, of international law. There are three men who might explain why this had to be done. Defense Minister Moshe Dayan died in 1981. General Uzi Narkis was commander of the troops in the region. Yitzhak Rabin was the army chief of staff. He maintains to this day there were commandos in the villages. We asked the man who went on to be prime minister why the villages were destroyed. It was through the fighting with the purpose to eliminate any possibility to this commando battalions, the Egyptian commando battalions, to hide themselves. 
there were a few days in which we were in a search of these two Egyptian commandos and to prevent them to have any place to hide themselves, we decided to get rid of whatever could serve them as an hiding place. Who gave the order to demolish these villages? I gave the order. It was your order? Yeah. But Mr. Rabin, the people in those villages were civilians. Does the fact that their side was the aggressor, in your view, um, provide that the Israeli army should be allowed to go in and demolish their homes, demolish their belongings, and send them packing? When the fighting started, practically there were almost no civilians there. They their places were taken by Jordanian and Egyptian uh, soldiers. Forgive me, Mr. Rabin, but one of your own, in fact, two uh, soldiers who were there, who were eyewitnesses to this, say that indeed what they found when they searched the homes of these people were villagers. They um, corroborated each other's experience by saying they did find one wounded Egyptian commando, but that these three villages were full of civilians who were not taking an active part in the war. These are two the Israeli of, soldiers. To Mr. the best of my knowledge, most of them ran away. Might be that after a few days they returned. The Geneva Convention to which Israel is a signatory clearly states that this kind of action is illegal. Articles 53 and 49 uh, state that the destruction of civilian property and the transfer of civilians is illegal. Allow me to remind you that at war there are certain rules of war. And whenever we are at war, we will do whatever is needed to protect Israel, to defend Israel, to defend Israel's population. General Uzi Narkis tells a different story. He was commander of the troops in the region, and he blames bloodshed in the War of Independence in 1948 for what happened. The road beneath the hills of Latrun that runs between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem was blocked by the Arab Legion. The Israelis fought long and gruesome battles there, and they lost. Today, the rusted remnants of Israeli convoys remain by the side of the road in memorial to their dead. The land on which the villages sat represents a painful memory for the military, a memory that provoked retribution, according to General Narkis. I think that it was an operation based on the difficult souvenirs of 48. It can look as if it were a sort of a revenge. I think that a strict order was never given. When we talked to Mr. Rabin about it, he told me that he gave an order and that it went through official channels for this to be, to be done. To destroy the, the, the villages? Yes. Uh, in my opinion, it was a local operation. But the suggestion that it was a renegade action by the troops on the ground is contradicted by soldier Amos Keenan's testimony. The children cried. Some of our soldiers started crying too. We also handed out cigarettes and candy. More soldiers burst into tears. The platoon commander decided to go to headquarters and find out if there were any orders about what to do with them. He returned saying that there were no orders in writing. Simply that they were to be driven out. In fact, Keenan complained to General Narkis about what was happening at Latrun. I asked an officer to see what was going on, but until he got to the place, I think that all the Arabs were already out of the villages. And later on, the houses were destroyed. Did you investigate who might have given that order then if it was done at a lower level than yourself? Was an investigation ever done of why this happened? No, I did not. Yitzhak Rabin says this land was cleared for strategic reasons. 
His central commander, Uzi Narkis, says it was a renegade action. But others believe Defense Minister Diane had reasons of his own. Yuri Avneri believes he wanted to straighten the border. What Diane wanted to do is to eradicate uh, the Arab villages in this area so that when he claims, so that he would claim, let's say, a border rectification in this area, there would be no Arab villages or no Arab people there, uh, which w could be used as an argument for not letting Israel have this have this area. This was, this was what, what it was all about. But Israel has refused to leave the West Bank land it occupied in 1967. The United Nations says it occupies it illegally, and Canada takes the same position. So a park that bears Canada's name on that land does not sit comfortably with Canadian foreign policy. Yet despite the sign and the names of the Canadian contributors sitting squarely in occupied territory, the Jewish National Fund maintains that government policy has not been contravened. No Canadian money was spent here, they say. That money all went into another part of the park, which they claim is within Israel's pre-1967 border. We simply would not do anything which was not consistent with uh, Canadian foreign policy. Yoin Goldstein was a fundraiser for the Canada Park project. There was no money that we spent during that time or indeed during any other time, uh, which was used, at least to the best of our knowledge, uh, beyond the 1967 borders. The Canadian JNF may believe that none of its money was spent in occupied territory, but it is hard to see how it could be avoided. Because Canada Park, according to every map we could find, appears to be entirely within occupied territory. This National Geographic map of the Holy Land includes the Green Line. It clearly puts Canada Park beyond the Green Line in occupied territory. This Israeli government map, which bears a JNF logo, puts the park in the same place. The same place as this map from the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, and clearly in occupied territory. We asked Benny Mushkin if all the cartographers had got it wrong. I don't know where they got this information. I Are really you don't. saying, sir, that they're wrong? Yes. That this is not yes. Canada Park? No, this, n not this only is Canada Park. Canada Park is much beyond this area. I just want to be clear about this because I'm, I'm confused. Are you saying to me that this area that says Canada Park, right. where the contributors' names are, yes. where the signs by the road say one kilometer to Canada Park, right. no Canadian money was spent here? That is correct. What evidence can you uh, produce for us that no Canadian money was used in this part of the park? I should prove to you that I did not invest money in this park. Well, you would think this being such a sensitive issue that the JNF might keep so some I'm files you, to show policy. precisely where the money was spent. We do have the files. JNF money is not being spent in areas beyond the Green Line, except in areas where there's a, in Jerusalem, which is also part of it where across the Green Line. Can we Otherwise, see those files that show which that? Fi which files? Yeah, the files that you said that show that no Canadian money was spent. Here. The file will show you that will tell you that that uh, Mr. So and So's contribution was invested in Canada Park. I can tell you that money was not invested directly in this in this area. But you have no breakdown. Do we have what a breakdown, Avi? No. no, no, we don't have a breakdown. If no money was spent here in occupied territory, we wondered about this sign, which clearly states that the Tannenbaums of Toronto had paid for the recreation area where we were sitting. I just want to be clear about this, that we're sitting beside the uh, Joey and Faye Tannenbaum recreation area, but they didn't pay for it? No, it they here. paid for recreation in Canada Park, but not this particular one. So this isn't it, even though the sign says we're sitting at the Tannenbaum, is, this is not that, it. That is right. It's somewhere else. That is right. Would, could you take us to where it is? I, 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 Abby, would you have a map to show us? Yeah, probably would, yes. The JNF officials never did take us to the Tannenbaum recreation areas that aren't in occupied territory. Joseph and Faye Tannenbaum are elderly, and their son Wayne spoke for the family in Toronto. I can't tell you specifically. I know we paid for certain recreational areas, but uh, when you pinpoint a map, as you know, these we're dealing with thousands of acres of land, or they, as they call them, dunams of land. This sign says the Valley of the Springs developed through the generosity of Joseph and Faye Tannenbaum, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Mm -hmm. What does that say to you about who paid for that? Sound, sounds uh, real and specific, yeah. 
Sounds like what? Sounds like they paid for it. The other Canadians, whose names are displayed in the park, likely donated money without ever knowing where it would be spent. But even if they weren't told and didn't know, they were being put in the middle of a bitter dispute. I think it's a very stupid idea on the part of those Canadian people who helped calling this park Canada Park. It's no business of any Canadian to intervene in a disputed issue. The land of Palestine, Eretz Israel, is disputed between two people. And let us not call any park Canada or Japan before peace is settled. If there is ever to be peace here, many believe Israel will have to trade land for it. The hatred each side holds for the other is as deeply rooted in Canada Park as anywhere in the Middle East. For the Palestinians, the land the park sits on represents their birthright. For the Israelis, the security of their nation. I don't see any Israeli leader that will give it up. Why? Why? Because we need it for Israel's security to maintain the line the road between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem sec totally secure as you would, wouldn't allow that the road between Toronto and Ottawa will be controlled by a potential enemy of Canada. The minimal requirements for the Palestinians is to have the right to self-determination in their own land and create their own independent state and their own entity. Uh, and secondly, to have the right to return to their birthplace and their homeland if they so choose. This must be fundamentally uh, obtained. Because if this is not obtained, there will be no peace in the Middle East. And I can assure you, no peace can, can last without, in, without justice. There is no peace today in this village in the West Bank. Israeli soldiers order Palestinian boys to remove pro-PLO graffiti. The hatred is passed like poison from generation to generation. In the graveyard, the tombstone of a teenager shot for his activities in the Intifada. Twenty-four years ago, his parents walked to this village from Imwas. A few blocks away, another family whose children fight their parents' battles. These boys grew up yearning to return to a demolished village they'd never seen. One of them is in jail for life for murdering a so-called collaborator. Down the street, a mother picks fruit for her youngest while her oldest awaits sentencing. In this house, too, the children were raised on stories of a return to a village long disappeared. This boy, just 16, was found guilty of murder, a murder committed for his parents' cause. We are prepared to sacrifice everything to our last drop of blood to achieve freedom. Even if your boy is, is the one who's paying? Even if I have to sacrifice the last child, my youngest Hakim, we will do it in order to have our country back. To close his report, Amos Keenan made a prophecy about the future of the people who had lived on the land now known as Canada Park. The children who went crying on the road will be fed Ayin in 19 years in the next round. Thus we have lost the victory.